Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's my privilege, really. Um, I want to start today talking about this, this project that you, you'd worked on some time ago, this television special called Murders at the Burger Joint. Uh, it, it piqued my interest. I, I like retro stuff. And I was online looking at old Burger Chef commercials, you know, to entertain myself. Yeah. And uh, and I came across these old stories about this terrible murder involving four young people way back in 1978. And mm -hmm. it is still something that haunts the community of Speedway, Indiana. How did you get involved in this cold case? Yeah, so thanks for having me on, Rick. Um, yeah, so I got involved with this case because um, I work for a production company uh, called Ample Entertainment, and they had just sold a series to Discovery, and essentially it was six separate cases, six separate one-hour specials, and it, I was just assigned that case, luckily, because uh, it's such an interesting case. So um, it was brought to me uh, to direct and produce it, and, uh, you know, I just kind of dove in head first, uh, kind of into the research side and learning about the case front to back, you know, police records, testimonials from the people. Um, and just the more I kind of read about it, the more interested I, I got into the case and, um, uh, it being a cold case, sorry for the spoilers, um, you know, I, that actually really piqued my interest at being a cold case and, you know, kind of why it went cold and, you know, why it never got solved 44 years later, probably won't get solved at this point. Uh, most of the people who could be responsible are passed away or gone missing at this point. But um, yeah, it was just a really interesting case, tragic case. And, um, you know, a lot of different angles on it, a lot of different theories people had on it, which also interests me there's a, a few different police agencies involved law enforcement agencies and um you know everyone had their own theory essentially the different groups one group thinks it was definitely bank robbers one group thinks it was definitely a kidnap murder you know so um that intrigued me as well um just the various kind of perspectives and people very staunch on their own perspective you know kind of like yes. you know because we had we had four victims here, and this is go back goes back to 1978, mm -hmm. and um, the names of these people. There's a miss, is it Shelby Fright, uh, Jane Freed, Jane Freed, Jane Freed, Mark Flemons, um, and Davis and Shelton. Yeah, right. Those are the four kids. Um, Jane Freed was the only adult. She was, but she was only uh, 19 at the time. And the rest were 17 and 16 year olds. So, you know, they were all kids, really tragic. Um, and essentially, you know, for the viewers who don't know what happened, all four of them were working at a burger chef uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, which in the time, 1978, burger chef was essentially mcdonald's number two competitor so they were like the second most popular fast food joint in america at that time um and they were working late and they were closing up shop and around 11 p.m ish after they had shut down they were robbed and these four kids were kidnapped and taken 22 miles away to a deserted field and killed in three different fashions as well so um that was also kind of peculiar about the case because normally in a killing people are killed by a gun or or by by one method but this was very odd because mark 
was beaten to death, we believe, with a chain. Jane was stabbed in the heart with a knife. And uh, the two others were shot execution style. So um, it was it was baffling to the community and the police. Um, and yeah, I mean, the first essentially huge mistake of this case and probably why this case never got solved was because when the cops showed up that night, they thought the kids took the money and, and went on a joyride and they didn't take it seriously like this was a crime scene and they didn't treat it like as such. And so they let the restaurant open the next day. It got cleaned. So whatever evidence may have been in that restaurant was immediately lost. Um, and so that really set the investigation back from the very onset. Right. It was what the a day later or two days later or something. They found one of the cars not too far from the restaurant. And that's what really made them start to worry and look at it differently. Yeah, I think. Well, I think after that night, you know, and like they once they spoke to the, the kids families and everything like these were good kids. And second of all, they weren't like friends, like they were work cool buddies, but they weren't the type to steal money and go out partying together. You know, they were different ages from different schools. They just happened to work at this same burger chef. So I think after about 24 hours, they realized, you know, we need to be taking this seriously to treat this like a proper investigation of, of a missing persons. And it took them 36 hours to find the bodies. Um, so and then they found Jane Freed's car across the street um, or, you know, a couple blocks away, essentially. And that was also kind of confusing because they didn't really know who moved the car, why the car was moved, how these kids were transported 22 miles away. Um, so there was just a lot of questions, you know, and they didn't have any answers early on. And so here we are over four decades later. There are still two main theories, I guess, that there was the possibility of two there was a spot somebody spotted or say they saw mm -hmm. two men near mm -hmm. the near the restaurant around that time so yeah. that's the first theory can you tell us about that yeah so that that's the one that we you know kind of lean in the most heavily essentially and that uh we have that character in our documentary um and you know i, I you know from meeting him and um you know filming with him for you know a couple of weeks um you know, I believe his story, essentially, you know, I think people often hide things, but they hide things for different reasons. So I don't, you know, I never, you know, you always got to take people for what they're saying with a grain of salt, obviously, and try to fact check and look into it. But there was an eyewitness to the kidnapping aspect. And he was outside, there was a Dunkin Donuts in the same parking lot as the burger chef right there. And he came outside for a cigarette. And as he's smoking a cigarette, he sees his orange van pull up. And he recognizes uh to the people in them in there and i'm blanking on the names right now because it's been a little while um yeah and he recognizes two guys and he says that you know they loaded the kids into the van there was some sort of argument mark flemens the only african-american in that he says was slammed up against the side of the van which actually tracks with the blunt force trauma on his face so that's like a like you know you tell that part of the story and that actually makes sense with you know the autopsy report um, and they load the kids in the van and, and they drive off. And, um, you know, there was the theory of, you know, Jane Freed's older brother was heavily involved in drugs. And there was also talk that she had might have gotten involved with her brother. And so this was some sort of like payback for the brother not paying a drug debt and that the other kids were sort of just collateral, essentially. Um, so that was that's always been like kind of the back and forth, like who was the main target of these four kids, right? And like, why did they go? And there's two kind of thoughts on that. Either it was Mark or it was Jane. But the stuff with Mark is kind of a lot of cloaked in racism back in that time. And like the facts around him are very loose. Like, oh, they saw Mark smoking weed. It's like, what, 16-year-old hasn't smoked weed? You know what I mean? Um, so... Jane, it looked, it felt like the information surrounding her, she was more tied to that world with the connections with her brother and from some of her friends we spoke to. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's that, that's, that's kind of like the main theory, um, that, you know, we kind of focus on, on the, in the documentary. And there's a second theory involving a man who was in prison facing a very lengthy prison term who came forward. And I think it was 
was it 1984 with a confession? Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So that other man, uh, he confessed in prison and um, to the murders, or it, I think he confessed to killing two of the kids, the ones that were shot with the gun execution style. So that was Davis and Shelton. Um, and this guy's and name was Donald Forrester. Donald Forrester. Exactly. Donald Forrester. And he had a rough, he had a bad record. He was in jail serving a 90 year, uh, 99 year uh, prison sentence for rape. And, you know, he had a, a pretty checkered past. Um, and he also had claimed that these shotgun shells uh, or the, the shells from the bullets he had shot, he flushed down his toilet. And so they, the cops, you know, even though this was 10 years later, he lived on a septic tank, which means everything he flushed down his toilet went to the septic tank and they were able to dig them out, but they were the wrong shell casings. And when, when you kind of dug deeper into his story, it really had a lot of holes in it. And what, what we kind of learned as well is that the police were kind of hoping he was the bad guy, you know what I mean? And they, it was kind of like, if I give you this information, I'll get a lesser prison sentence. And so it kind of hit once you kind of dive deeper into that theory, it doesn't, it doesn't really hold up at all. Um, the other theory that didn't even make the documentary was that there was these bank robberies happening at that time. And a lot of burger chefs actually were getting robbed in that area and in the surrounding areas. And so there was thought that this could have just been a bank robbery gone wrong. And there was, and there are facts around that, that can support that theory. Um, but what's interesting, but you know, with a 43 minute documentary, there's only so many theories you can put in there, obviously. Um, there is about six or seven running theories through the police departments and the sheriff's office, um, about, you know, there was a car scene leaving the burger chef where a guy threw out a gun out of his car. That was the same caliber as the gun that was used to kill um davis and shelton now you know sometimes the easiest answer is the one that's right in front of you but um that was looked at debunked but you know you never know for sure and, and that's the whole point like if you think you know the answer for sure then you don't know this case because there's so many different possibilities and that's what makes it intriguing i think so as a, a filmmaker a director um, what did you take away from all of this? Was there, was there value in the project? Oh, there was a lot of value in the project. I think, I think, um, anytime you could tell a story about, you know, real people whose lives were ruined, um, by, you know, unnecessary violence, you know, especially kids or, you know, young adults, I think it has value and, and people should hear those stories. Um, and it, and it's good to, to, you know, see, see all sides of a subject, you know what I mean? And to see the law enforcement side and, and to see the family side and to see the people from the town side and to get that full perspective and try to just put the information out there, you know, and then let people decide what they think. Um, but I think it, it has value and I, I'm proud of the work that we were able to do. Um, and I know the the at least the families appreciated it because they want their story told. I think they still hold out hope that it will be solved. Um, uh, but you know, forty four years is a long time. You know, we've heard crazier stories. Um, you know, with technology and DNA and that stuff developing. Um, but it, this one's going to be pretty difficult um, to crack. I think at this point because. Right. At the end of the day, it could be an eyewitness account, but without hard evidence, you can't really get a conviction, you know, just from an eyewitness account. You know, you need something more than that. And that was the reason why the guy who spotted the people kidnapped the kids. He, you know, he came forward with the information late, like years later, and they just didn't view him as a credible witness, in which, you know, he had, you know, he drank a lot. He was drinking that night of, you know, the spotting, though alcohol doesn't make, cause you to hallucinate, but um he you know the validity of him and his report wasn't wasn't strong um and you know people changed their story for all kinds of reasons we don't know um and so that kind of shot holes in it you know the community itself is still haunted by this as i said it's uh it's an incident that they carry with them uh, is is the community still going through a 
a healing process of, of some kind with this? Uh, are they looking as, as a community for any kind of closure or is it something that's kind of in the distant past and distant memory for people? Well, I think definitely with the older people in the community, it, it still is there. You know what I mean? I think every time they have an anniversary, it gets brought up again. You know, they had the 40th anniversary and the cops, they decided to release an image of the knife of what had, Jane Freet was stabbed with in the heart. And they released that image. You know, it's an old rusty knife, just hoping, grasping at straws for something. But they did a press conference and uh, the sister of Shelton, Teresa, she came and spoke and she, you know, she spoke really eloquently there. So obviously for the people that it affected and for the people around that community, it still lives there. I don't think the younger generation knows, but essentially if you say the burger chef murders anywhere around speedway indianapolis you know when i was there last year people still knew it you know it, it was not it was not gone um it's a very well-known case it got a lot of national attention it was a big shocker for you know that community but it was a national story at that time yeah. um you know and so i think it it's still there but it's you know i think for the younger generation not so much and that's exactly it it, it was a story that did receive national, even international attention mm -hmm. because it was uh, also uh, covered up here in Canada to, to some degree. It was covered in Canada. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, uh, well, we didn't have as much gun violence back then, you know, and, you know, so I think today, you know, we've had more mass shootings in America than we've had days in the year so far in 2023. So it's just, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a different time. And back then it, it was a rarity to, to, for these kind of things to happen. And now not so much. So I think with the 24 hour news cycle, you know, people kind of things get lost quickly, you know. Was there anything new, any new information that came to light while you were doing your work? Yeah, I mean, the podcasters we had in there. Um, they, they, you know, they were actively researching the case and, and, and still trying to find different people. Um, I think some of the new information we found through them was, um, uh, this, these friends of Jane Freet who were able to cooperate that she actually was involved with this drug ring that her brother was involved with and that, you know, her brother and his connections with some of the suspects. Um, so that was some interesting new information we were able to uncover. Um, and well, a lot of it was new to me, so I, it was all new, <laughs> but, um, that was kind of, pro that was probably the biggest piece of kind of new information we were able to find out. So this is still, can, can still be seen online streamed through the investigation discovery websites, um it's, discovery it's, plus so if yeah. you have the discovery plus app you can watch it there um uh, you can buy it on demand or on I'm, I'm sure you could stream it if you have the id channel app the investigation discovery app you can stream it there and maybe don't quote me but since hbo and discovery channel and warner brothers are now one corporation and now they're changing the name of hbo to max um it might be on max eventually uh, i'm not sure but that's a possibility it could be streamed there as well yeah. And, uh, I, I guess you're, you're still working in, in this same vein, right? You're working on a new project that is also a, a true crime story. Tell us, tell us what you're working on now. Yeah. So I'm doing a, a series called murder in the heartland. It's for investigation discovery. Uh, this is the sixth season. This is the third season I've, uh, been the co-executive producer of. And essentially it's a show, it's a contained show. So every episode, it's a new murder in a new small town. Um, and yeah, I've been traveling across the country currently in Missouri right now doing an episode and yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's tragic. It's uplifting. It's, you know, each case has its own unique set of circumstances that make it, uh, interesting and hard as well to do. Uh, but you know, every episode we always make sure that we have law enforcement involvement, we have family or friends involvement, and it's also really important for us to capture the town and the people of that community to like bring it to light and and show and show that community 
you know, for what it is. Um, so we hope it's a positive thing for the victims' families. They can, you know, have it as something to shine a light on their their loved one and you know keep them remembered. Uh, and also, you know, maybe just storytelling to help people not shoot each other. Hopefully, right. And I guess it's an opportunity for you as well to tell these stories from a human perspective to mm -hmm. show people who the victims were as people so that they're, they actually are remembered. Yeah. And that, that's super key is, is showing these victims, like you said, as real people with faults and, and good things. And like, you know, things aren't black and white. People aren't black and white. No one's good or bad. Everyone's a shade of gray. You know, I mean, we all have things. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the same thing with law enforcement. When we work with law enforcement, we just don't want to show them in a badge and, you know, the tough guy driving around with the gun, we, we show them at home and playing with their kids and doing things that they normally do and show them as human beings. And it's important for us to get people in those natural environments and uh, showcase them as real people and um, give a 360 to a person, you know, not just show them from one angle of just, you're just the cop, you're just the victim, you know what I mean? Show them from all perspectives. And then, and then that gives the audience a, a real viewpoint of who these people are and who these, you know, the, these uh, towns are as well. There must be certain challenges that come with doing this kind of work because you're not coming in as the investigation is happening. You're coming in after the fact, sometimes years after mm -hmm. um, digging into these cold cases. So what do you do to work, work against the challenges of coming up with say footage and mm -hmm. uh, you know, images, pictures. So hard, and all those cases are closed cases. Um, so every case we do, the murder has been caught and put away. Uh, the murders at the burger joint, that was a, a standalone one hour special. So, but there are challenges like the case I'm doing right now is from 2005, you know? Um, and so simple challenges, people's memories are, are faded. You know, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, and people move away and, people die and that's always difficult. Um, and some, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to get the family on board. They don't want to relive it. They don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, so that can be difficult as well, getting the family members on board. Um, but at times, you know, sometimes people don't want to talk about this stuff. And then when I come in, uh, an outsider who doesn't know all the things and, and listens to them and speaks with them, it can be cathartic for them as well, I feel like, and it can be helped to get it off their chest, have a cry about it, you know, and, and that can help them process it more instead of sometimes people bottle this stuff up for years and it just goes nowhere. You know, as a, as a journalist, I always see value in telling stories and, um, and looking at the human aspects of things so that people not only rem remember, but also learn uh, to take something of value away from it. You know, but in Canada in particular, I've, I've noticed over my career that sometimes murder cases in particular or anything dealing with death, people here are not as receptive to this kind of content. I think about the, the Paul Bernardo, Carla Homolka killings here in Canada and a lot of that stuff, people just didn't want to hear about it anymore. There was there was a, a documentary produced and people were, were against it. They like, don't just don't talk about that stuff. But on the U.S. side, um, it, oh, it's, we're obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a, a really a different attitude, which I think is healthier, honestly, mm -hmm. because people are willing to just deal with information and just just accept it and and uh, absorb it and learn from it. What are your views on that? Where Where is the, the positive and the negative in all of that? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting you said Canada is kind of the opposite because I think now in America, we have such a high saturation of murder content. I mean, you could just type in the word murder into any, you know, streaming app. You'll find a hundred shows. You'll find a hundred documentaries, yeah. you know? So now we went from just being a couple murder shows to being a lot, you know? And so... I think it's good in one sense, but I think in a sense it, it can be too much and it can be sensationalizing it a little bit um, and feeding into the machine, I guess you could say in some regard. Um, but, you know, I think you're right. And on one level, it is good that, you know, this stuff is happening. 
let's look at it and let's just look at it and and accept it for what it is and try to learn from it and move on. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it can be too much. And like, you know, it, it can be a little um, sensationalistic, sensational, sensationalistic and and kind of promoting certain stereotypes, beliefs that we might have about law enforcement or or certain groups of people, you know, and so it, it can have a negative side too. I think it all depends on like how you make it and your ethics and your sort of code of having that journalistic integrity, you know, when you're doing documentary work of, you know, um, really trying to dig into what the facts are, not what the, what you want them to be or how you perceive them, but, uh, really just trying to dig in and, and figure out, um, what's there and, and not telling your audience what to think or feel. I think that's a key difference. You know, for me, every film I've ever made or show I've ever done, it's like not pushing an idea on them, just laying out the information as clearly and concisely as I can, and then letting the audience decipher that and, and make their own, uh, you know, call on it essentially. Yeah. So before we, we move on and, and, and get into this political discussion that I, I'd, I'd like to have a little bit, is there anything with regard to either, the, either of those documentary productions that you worked on, anything on that side that you, you think I might be missing or that you'd like to add? About those two shows? Yeah. Um, no, but I will tell you about one other documentary. I, sure. Uh, it's called Failure to Protect. It's a feature documentary. Uh, and it's about three parents who lost their kids to child protective services and who are trying to get their kids back from the system. And it's told from the perspective of parents, because um, as I got deep into the child welfare system, I know Canada had a huge class action lawsuit against their child welfare system uh, not too long ago uh, for the abuses they had against Native Americans. Um, but it's just it's a sad, broken system, and it really uh, doesn't listen to parents, and it really takes their voices and squashes them. And so it was really important for me to make a documentary from the parents' perspective and to sh give them a voice and to show, you know, we're human beings, you know, and uh, everyone makes mistakes, but do they rise to the level of your kids needing to be take away taken away from you? Um, and so that documentary went through the film festival circuit. Um, I just signed a distribution deal. It's not available yet, but uh, it will become available in the next couple of months uh, to stream. So. Okay. And do you know which distribution platforms you might be on at that point or? I don't know yet. Sure? Okay. So when I do, I'll let you know. <laughs> it, there, there must be absolutely a political aspect to that because what we're really talking about there is parental rights. A hundred percent, a hundred percent parental rights are a huge deal, uh, in the film and, um, and for parents, you know, um, and it, it, it is political for sure. Um, you know, uh, and it's, I like the issue a lot actually, because it didn't really matter if I was talking to a conservative or progressive about the issue. Like they had different problems with the system, but across the board, you know, here in America, all the professionals believe the system is broken and they know it's unjust. They know, and essentially, you know, obviously it goes back to money where, well, how are these agencies incentivized, right? They're incentivized by taking kids and putting them in the system because per kid they put in the system, they make about $4,000 per kid. So the money incentive, incentivize, instead of incentivizing the money to give parents resources, give families help, right? If the money was incentivized that way, well, you wouldn't have a problem, right? You, you right. kids would stay with families. They would get the help they need. I mean, most of the time it's single mom with four kids, two jobs, you know what I mean? And they're a human being and they make mistakes. And um, what they need is help. You know, they, what they don't need is their kids ripped away, thrown in the foster care system. A bunch of trauma happens to them. They get them back a couple of years later. Then it takes them a couple of years to deal with all that trauma that they went through. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's a broken system, but it was eye opening to learn about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's a subject matter I'm really passionate about. Um, and I think it's one of those things where if you never had contact with it, you have no idea about it. You know, um, it's kind of like now in America, most people know 
the prison industrial complex is a broken system. I, I think it's kind of common knowledge now. It, maybe 15 years ago, it wasn't. Uh, but most people know that now, and I would like that to be the same about the child welfare system so we can get some real federal legislation in there to change it and get the incentives changed, remove hearsay from the courtroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of issues there. Yeah, just follow the money and you'll see where the incentives are and why the yeah. system works the way that it does. Yeah, no. I mean, that's that's an easy trick for most systems. Follow the money and you'll learn a lot. Yeah. And as we speak about politics, you worked on another documentary uh, some time ago called Bernie Blackout. That also piqued my interest because, of course, we talk about politics on this program a lot. First of all, t tell tell our audience what the, the, the that documentary was about. Bernie Sanders, obviously, but more yeah. than that. Yeah, so uh, a colleague of mine, Pat McGee, who directed and produced the uh, feature doc, um, he just started following Bernie Sanders around in the 2020 campaign, uh, following him around, filming him and his colleagues. Um, and he was able to package that and sell that feature doc idea to Vice TV. And uh, we made a feature documentary on it. And essentially what it's about is, you know, the way Bernie Sanders came to, it's about the media's reaction to the rise of Bernie Sanders and especially the quote unquote left wing media's uh, reaction to Bernie Sanders, meaning MSNBC and CNN's reaction to a progressive. And for people who don't know what a progressive is, it's not what sort of Joe Biden is and what like a Hillary Clinton or a Barack Obama may be. Those are centrists, you know, um, they don't believe in, you know, nationalized health care, um, things like that. And so what happened, what was really interesting about in the film is as we were editing it, Bernie Sanders was, you know, making his run for the 2020 camp uh, presidential election. So that was exciting and also very sad when he lost for us. <laughs> but what the film is about is sort of the way the media handled him and first tried to ignore him. I think it's first you ignore them, then you attack them. And I forget what the third uh version of that is and it kind of went to a lot of specifics in it like there's this carl rove theory he's a famous republican consultant and he says when you're attacking a political can't uh, opponent you don't pick their weakest element you pick their strongest element right and bernie sanders strongest element was his 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 grassroots support right that was his strongest element he's still the most liked politician in america by far he's got the most followers He's got any time he goes to speak in any city in this country, 50,000 people show up, you know, 50,000 people don't show up for the president to come talk, you know, but they show up for Bernie Sanders. And so what they did was they 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 attacked that element, which was his supporters, and they turned them into like, you know, they twisted it into like this negative support thing where the whole thing was his supporters were these horrible people. And we had this uh, analyst in the documentary who analyzed 100 million tweets from all political candidates. And they found that every candidate had about 10% of their supporters that would post negative, right? That would say something negative about other people or other politicians. Sanders, the same, 10%. But what you don't see is if you take all the other candidates in that presidential election and you combine their uh, social media followers together, they don't even match what Bernie Sanders has. So it's a, it's a volume thing. So they're able to pick and cherry negative comments and kind of say, look at Bernie's supporters. They're so out of line. They're so, they're so mean. They're so hateful, all these things. And they just kind of wrote a narrative. I think even during the campaign, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, chair wrote an op-ed saying they felt they got more they got fairer news on Fox News than they did get on MSNBC. And that and that's crazy, right? You would think, oh, MSNBC, it's a liberal network. Why wouldn't? But, you know, there is a big push against uh, progressive politics within the Democratic Party. They really don't want them. They really attack progressives, which is very odd since most of Democrats are progressives. Um, you know, but it's also a money thing. You know, those networks get paid by 
oil and gas, just like Fox News gets paid by oil and gas, by health insurance companies, by pharmaceutical companies. They make a lot of money for these people. So if he's talking about nationalizing health care, well, that's going to affect the money that their, you know, sponsors pay them. So, of course, they're going to attack them. You know, even though every first world country, every, you know, Western country in the world has nationalized health care besides America, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So it just kind of showed the hypocrisy of the um, the media and their response to him um, and their continued response to him. So, and I guess you're also exposing the uh, the Democrat machine too, the DNC, because the whole thing was really stolen from him. I mean, definitely in 2016, there was a lot more. I I think. You know, but that was also the great thing about Bernie is, you know, he had Debbie Wasserman, right? Correct, if, if I'm not wrong, who, yeah. how, you know, had they had the super delegates and they were, those were just going to Hillary automatically. Like essentially no people were even voting for her. Those were just automatic handovers. And so he fought and he got those rules changed. You know what I mean? Um, and what happened in 2020 uh, was, you know, I think... Um, I think the establishment decided they realized that Bernie Sanders is incredibly popular and it's going to be, you, if you have five candidates, right. And one of them being Bernie, the four are going to eat each other's votes away. Bernie's strong. He, it doesn't matter. Like he's got a base, he's got a following. He, you know, he, he's got grassroots, right. People that are really right. passionate. Right. And so what they did at the end, when it looked like he, he was going to win, I mean, from the reporting, it says Obama called Buttigieg, uh, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, and they coalesced. They dropped out same day. It was right around my birthday, very sad day. And, uh, you know, they coalesced. And when they did that, they were able to, uh, you know, bring that together and um, unfortunately take him out, you know, and that was that was a real shame. And it's it's unfortunate within the Democratic Party that they attack uh the progressive voices um you know because that's the growing population of the party you know what i mean there's not more people aren't interested more in you know neoliberalism i think that's something we all mm -hmm. kind of know about now that's we, we we don't want that we want real change you know we don't want um we don't want fake change you know we want to have health care you know we want to have education you know we want to take care of the environment you know we don't want our kids to have to learn drills of how to not get shot in their schools. Um, these are the things we care about. Um, and, you know, I think that message actually resonates with even conservatives, even independents. And I think they would always say, well, Bernie's too left, this left, right, whatever. It's his policies, his, his way of speaking, because the one thing he had that no other Democrat had was authenticity. You might hate everything that comes out of his mouth, but at least you know he's not full. He's not full of it, right? That's do you think? One. Do you think it's fair to say that even though he's progressive, he's also the, there's an also a populist element to the Bernie Sanders movement that sort of overlaps even into the into the Trump camp. I've seen sort of some of those supporters. You know, when, when Bernie lost, it, it looked to me like a lot of those Bernie supporters actually went over to the Trump camp. I think it could be perceived that way to an, to a degree, the populist angle. Um, I just think, yeah, I think at the end of the day, he had authenticity. Trump perceives to have authenticity, which I feel like he has zero of. But, um, you know, he had perceived authenticity. Um, so that's what, that's where I think you could see some crossover possibly. Um, and also, you know, Bernie did really well in, in 2016, you know, in the Midwest, in those working class communities where, you know, like the LBJ Democrats and the Truman Democrats, what, that's where we were very strong with the working class community. And we've gotten away from that, unfortunately, into corporate politics. Now, in my opinion, the hundred percent of the Republican party is bought and sold by corporations. I would say 30 to 30 to 40% of the democratic party is bought and paid for by corporations. Um, you know, and him doing, you know, not taking any money that, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, from, you know, only taking it from human beings, you know, and I think that was a key. And I think there can be some crossover, and I, you know, someone described politics to me as a circle, right? It's not, it's not a straight line. 
not left over here, right over here. Right. You know, if you go so far right, you'll end up left. If you go so far left, you'll end up right. You know, um, and so it is I a agree circle. With that. Yeah. And uh, you know, you could draw connections from QAnon people to hyper liberal uh, meditation people. You know, and and you saw that during COVID too. You know, uh, where those beliefs kind of, you know, met in the middle uh, to a degree. So I think there is some overlap, but I think fundamentally, if you're really talking about what Trump wants and what Bernie Sanders wants for our country, they are so far apart. They're not even close. Um, you know, and I, I think it's more of how they make you feel is what, is what connects them more or less, not really what they're about, you know? And you kind of touched on, I would say branding or the way you're describing the type of Democrat that you have, an LBJ Democrat, mm -hmm. or, you know, even if you want to talk about Trump, you've got MAGA Republicans. Mm -hmm. Now we have these Kennedy Democrats. We have mm -hmm. RFK Jr. running mm -hmm. uh, in. Yeah. After having done all this work on on that documentary, it gives you a unique perspective, I think a, a deeper understanding. How do you see all of that playing out? Does RFK Jr. have any chance? Is there any possible path to victory for him? Or is the DNC just too, I don't want to use the word corrupt, but are they too corrupt <laughs> in their process? Yeah. I mean, look, we, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the DNC myself either. Um, still registered Democrat, full disclosure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't think uh, RFK is, you know, the right fix. Like, look, I think President Biden has done some positive things and he's some, done some negative things, you know, and and the and if you're looking at it, it depends which lens you're looking at it from, right? If you're looking at it from a progressive lens, I would say, you know, he hasn't, you know, done what he promised, you know, and a lot of it can be blamed on, you know, uh, Senator Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, who are gross and disgusting and block the reform of the filibuster, which essentially now allows the minority party to block all and every legislation. So you can't even have a democracy anymore because if I score 51 points and you score 50, I won the game. So, you know, like that's, that's the score. That was the score in the Senate. We, you know, we should have been passing, you know, voting rights legislation. We should have been passing these big bills and, and president Biden blamed it on, you know, those two senators, which rightfully so they were blockading important legislation. Uh, Joe Manchin has a coal company in West Virginia. So of course he's going to block every single piece of environmental legislation he can get his hands on. Um, but then I would also say to the president, you know, he didn't do a good job of whipping those votes and, and getting those people in shape and giving them consequences. You know, um, if they promised to vote on this bill, um, then they should have, you know, and then why are they the chairs of the committees? Why are they on these committees? So as far as 2024, I think a lot of us were hoping Biden would not run again. I think the conventional thinking from the DNC is uh, incumbents easier to win uh, than than a new face. Uh, but I, I think conventional thinking isn't really super valuable um, in, in modern times. I think uh, I think Trump's a joke, and I think uh, he's our best. We're, we're I mean, every Democrat's praying that Trump gets the nomination because he's our best chance to win. Um, you know, and I would love for Biden to get primaried by, uh, some progressives or some other Democrats. I think it's just RFK to me, doesn't seem like the type that can really DNC or not. Like, I, I don't think he's, he's that guy. And then, then you get back to, well, he's just one of the candidates. Like young people aren't going to get excited about a Kennedy. Like we, you know, the reason why they love Bernie because he was new and that he was fresh and that he was a person had stood by his values and his morals for 40 years. You can watch videos of this guy fighting for the same thing for 40 years. You watch a politician from one year ago, his whole agenda's changed, you know what I mean? And so that was a refreshing thing, I think, for the younger generation. Um, so I don't know. I think it's going to be a, a tough election for Biden. Um, not all of it his fault, um, some of it his fault, you know? And then from the conservative side, they act like he's, you know, burning the world down. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. our modern day Republican Party has no agenda. They have, uh, th they're a party that 
it has one goal it's to gain power and to keep their rich friends rich that's it they have no agenda they haven't they don't pass laws they don't have any bills they bring forward the only things they bring forward are making abortion illegal and being mean to trans people those are the only bills they bring forward mm. they you know they don't address socioeconomic issues they don't address environmental issues um they don't address any issues of substance they they're they, they're smart politically though that's the thing is they're very smart politically and they control the conversation and they can message very very effectively to their base and they can you know get that message out and so biden not a great communicator not a great orator and just you know the, the age thing unfortunately is a problem especially if you know ron DeSantis gets through i mean that'll be a 40-year age gap and I know most Democrats do not like that matchup at all. I'll tell you that much. Um, and Trump, you know, it, I think uh, he's still, you know, he's lost two elections now. You know, I, I think, I think it'd still be tight though. I, I don't think Biden would win by as much as he would have won as he won in 2020 if it's him against uh, Trump. But as far as RFK, I don't know him enough. I've seen him speak. I think he's okay, but. To me, he didn't grab me. You know, he didn't. Well, I mean, he's big on, you know, his vaccine rhetoric. He says he'll release all of the papers uh, surrounding the JFK investigation, mm -hmm. says that uh, he would free Julian Assange, says that any candidate that supports the war in Ukraine, he would not um, he would not throw his support behind. So that automatically rules out him uh, accepting any olive branch from Biden if Bi if Biden is declared the candidate so there won't be any reconciliation or common ground there um is is he actually in the democrat camp now because we've heard some people say he should quit the part the dnc and go run as a republican really i didn't even hear that i mean i the only two people i've heard of is him and marion wilson uh williamson running as far as challengers but to me they're not you know they're not strong challengers um they're just not and bernie's fighting the age thing too and he won't run against biden because he's too too locked into the party he doesn't want to ruffle feathers so you would need someone you know maybe like a governor or somebody like that with some credibility uh to possibly come in but it you know i would love a strong primary you know against biden i think he should get primaried i think it'd be good for the party to primary him and not just let him walk right in for round two um but we just need to find that candidate i don't know who that person is yet you know um there's a lot of people i really like but um you know I, i'm just not sure anyone's got the the uh you know the guts the guts to do it because you know they're worried about the backlash so i think if you if you were a governor you'd be on a better playing field to do it instead of being in congress where I think the backlash would be more severe um, to actually primary him. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a scary election. You know, you know what scares me the most though, is this extreme polarization that I'm seeing on the political landscape. Mm -hmm. And there's so much emotion. We mm -hmm. see Biden saying that the greatest threat to democracy and, and the country is white supremacists over here. You know, you have, you, you touched on people being, mean to transgenders so you've got uh you know this this other ex sort of extreme perspective mm -hmm. and point of view it seems like the two sides can no longer talk to each other they mm -hmm. can speak entirely different languages are you does that worry you because uh, to me that seems like an existential threat to the country yeah, yeah no that's totally a huge concern of uh, the polarization obviously social media has been a huge issue with that and um data privacy and that's a huge issue you know if you type in barack obama into your google search and i type in barack and Obama into my google search well guess what we're gonna get very different results and that's not the way information needs to be disseminated you know right when you're looking up when you're trying to get information on something it shouldn't be tailored to what you already want to believe or how you already yes. think you you just need to get the information and you might not like it and that's okay you know um but I think the issue is like face-to-face uh, -face contact or having real conversations because, you know, when I do this show, Murr in the Heartland, I'm going to small town, middle America, 
all the time. I'm hanging out in police stations. I'm hanging out with people that are very different from me politically, but guess what? I have to make common ground with them. Guess what? I have to, I eat lunch with them. I, I break bread with them. I meet their families and we find ways to connect. You know what I mean? And that's the most important thing I think for Americans. The only way you can break this cycle, it's not going to be on the phone. It's not going to be over the computer. It's going to be human to human interaction start to get to know people that are different from you and stop shying away from it. You know what I mean? If they're, you know, different political parties, sit down, have a conversation. I've talked to many Republicans about guns, you know, uh, all kinds of hot button issues, you know, but I, I love doing that because when you're face to face with people and you, you know, and you speak clearly and, and without, you know, hate, you know, like kind of just like saying your view, but, you know, in a calm manner, you can kind of get somewhere. And, and actually, most of the time, when I have these discussions with people, we usually get to like a, a reasonable middle ground place at some point. Uh, we don't have to totally agree with each other. But, you know, we, we kind of get somewhere. And so I think if people can get out of their bubbles a bit more, I think that will help uh, the polarization. But you know, as you know, the media loves the polarization. Politics is like a football game in America, red team versus the blue team. You know, who's going to win, you know, even the way the graphics and the marketing go, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a sports, a sports event and that's how they treat it. And it's so far from that. These are people's lives. And, um, you know, we need to come together to make our country a better place or it's just, it's just going to keep on the same cycle we're on, which is not a positive one. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with you. You you're you're speaking my language, even though we may not agree on everything. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. 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 Exactly. No, I think that's that's the key. And you know, it's funny, it's like, you know, I live in California in Los Angeles, and I didn't know this, but there was all uh, when I started the show Mer in the Harlan, I didn't realize how many people disliked you if you were just from the state of California in America. They don't like you because you're from California. And I just thought it was and, and that that's totally a product of, you know, right wing media, right? That's that's Fox yeah. News every single day hammering. And I'd ask people like, well, have you spoken to anyone? For, am I the first Californian you've met face to face in like years? And they're like, yeah. So it's not, you know, people are getting these views and these viewpoints from, you know, outlets and devices and media that want you to feel a certain way, want you to think a certain way. And so the more you can just break away from the dumb phone and the dumb computer and just go out and talk to somebody and have a conversation, that's how we're going to break the cycle. But we're not going to break it over 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 a screen. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. I noticed it, this is way off, off mm -hmm. this, this topic, but sure. I noticed that you also worked on a series called Autobiography. I think you were an editor on that. Oh uh, yeah, that was a uh, Motor Trend show. <laughs> that was uh, about cool old cars and yeah. uh, stories of old cars. I think one had to do with a murder and uh, one it, just old cool uh, automotive stories. That was kind of fun. Um, and obviously, you know, cool cars are cool cars. So who doesn't want to, you know, look at a cool car? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it looks like you 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 had some movie cars in there. I think there was a the James Bond Lotus Esprit, the one that yeah. went underwater and all of that stuff. So you you kind of touched on all the the uh, the iconic. Uh, yeah, cars. yeah, we did one on the on um, Mulholland Drive, I believe it was because uh, they they used to use it back in the twenties. People would just race on it. It was just like a you know dumb dummy racetrack, and people yeah. would race on it and there's so many cars that have fallen off the side that if you go on hikes down there there'll be cars that have weeds in it and i've been there for 50 years just because they had so many crashes back in the day they couldn't even pull out half the amount of cars that uh, flew off there and that's and the name of the show autobiography mm -hmm. is important because the idea here was that every car has its own story. So mm -hmm. if these cars could talk, they would tell you one heck of a story, but that's yeah. really what you've done is you've given these cars a voice in that, that show. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that that's, you said it perfectly. If these cars could talk. Yeah, exactly. They would have a lot to say. Um, but no, I think that's cool. I think learning about history through a different lens is always interesting, you know, whether it be an automotive thing or, 
you know, art or, you know, politics or whatever, like you can, you can learn a part of history through a lot of different ways. And um, I think that's the great thing about filmmaking. That's why I love my work is that each project is a new challenge. It's a new th a way to learn something new uh, and uh, to kind of expand your mind, your horizons. So um, yeah. that's why I'm blessed to do what I do and hopefully to continue to keep doing it. Well, we've touched on a lot of different uh, subject matter here. It just shows the, the the broad expanse of your experience and and the projects you've worked on. And I'm so grateful for you you joining us on the program today. It, Thank it's you. It's an Appreciate absolute that. privilege. Yeah. Yeah, pleasure. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off today? Um, I, I will say one thing. Uh, another one-hour special I directed, which will be on the ID channel, Investigation Discovery, on June 27th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's called uh, What Happened to Valentino Dixon. And it will also the next day uh, be streaming on Discovery Plus and Max, which is a.k.a. the new HBO. Um, and, uh, that's just a great story of a man who was wrongfully convicted of murder and eventually got let out of prison 26 years later. Uh, he's an incredible human being and, uh, got let out of prison essentially through his art, uh, drawing golf courses, crazy enough. Um, so I'm really proud of that work, that project. And, uh, I recommend you guys checking it out. So June 27th and 28th, they'll be available. Excellent. And do you have a website or social media? Where can people find you if they want? To um, I have an out of date website. So find me on social media. It's uh, sorted underscore cilantro 24 S O R T E D cilantro 24. And that's because the name of my production company is sorted pictures. My favorite herb is cilantro. And my lucky number is 24. Excellent. So. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you so much for joining okay. us on the program. Thanks, Rick. All right. Folks, we'll be back right after this. Don't go away. News. The world is watching.